<laughs> Welcome to the fourth Glot Political Theatre as a Civil Right episode, a fortnightly online platform presenting political theatre from around the world, hosted by HowlRound Theatre Commons. Uh, my name is Cinziana Kojokarescu. I am co-artistic director and co-founder of Vesna Theatre, a British-Romanian political theatre collective devoted to challenging institutionalized and normalized violences in our society through theatre. Tonight, we are going to talk about political, satirical, and community theatre in the Middle East with Dina Musawi, who is a British Iraqi actor, director, and theatre producer. Her career spans theatre, television, and film. Uh, and Lara Sawala, a Jordanian British actor based in London whose work includes film, th theatre, and TV in both the Middle East and the UK. And Nabil Sawalha, the well-known Jordanian actor and political satirist. The conversation will begin around Nabil and his theatre show, Peace O Peace, Salam Ya Salam, which was produced in Jordan and toured to Palestine and Israel. Uh, we now have a pre-recorded message from Nabil, which offers little context. Political theatre in the Middle East. <coughs> the Middle East has been a political arena from the beginning of time. We are come here across uh, the crossroad of the worlds. So we have never been without occupation. And uh, the big powers find it a very nice arena for political games and for testing their latest weapons as well. Uh, so we, politics are in our blood. Uh, actually, <laughs> I, was, I was born uh, at the beginning of the Second World War and my name was uh, Harb, War. Then my mother changed it later. So, and I was singing uh, against the occupation of Palestine at the age of five in Madaba, which is not Palestine, my hometown. So, and then uh, you get up, you know, uh, I mean, I remember at school when a teacher would say, uh, next Wednesday there'll be an exam. We'd say, ha, 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 maybe, if there is no coup d'etat or revolution or an occupation. So the Middle East really is, uh, and because of all the religious conflicts, a lot of history here, and some of it is bitter, not nice, and uh, the West knows that very well and knows how to ignite it whenever they want to for their own interest. So how do we survive in the Middle East against this? We survive with humor. Yeah. We, I did theater for nearly 20 years with very small audiences. It's not part of our world, the normal theater and Epson and Oscar Wilde and all that. But when we did political theater and we put uh, the, leaders, the uh, leaders of the world on stage and satirized them, it was like putting ice on hot hearts. People were so happy to see that happening because of all the pressures they have against these uh, nasty politicians who, in, in the Middle East, they play with our bread. Yeah, they play with all our lives. They affect all our lives. So when we started theater, political theater, we had in the audience kings, prime ministers, ministers, university professors, uh, village women, uh, six-year-old kids, because they all know politics, because politics is very much part of our life. So when we laughed at it, it was the, uh, the greatest step in our uh, world in the Middle East. And that's why how our theater was, was born. And then we've laughed at uh, peace, oh peace. Uh, and I remember uh, they asked me in the uh, Newsweek, why are you doing this play? I said, because uh, it's a business. We make wars and then we make peace. It's a good business. So we have to laugh at it, otherwise, our life becomes a tragedy. And that's how our political theater was born and was very successful. And uh, it was a, a, a great human step to bring people together. But uh, the business of war, there are many people make good money out of it, uh, individuals and countries, that they don't want total peace. It's bad for business. Thank you 
so much for sending that video. Uh, that's a very beautiful way of putting it, that laughter is like cold ice on hot hearts. Um, I wanted to ask you, Nabil, um, has politics always been a part of your work? Uh, have you always made political theater or political art? Uh, Nabil, you're muted. We can't hear you. If you could, uh, if you could unmute yourself. Uh, there is a button, button. Just click the microphone where it says mute, the bottom left. Okay. okay. Excellent. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm deaf, but mute, that's a new one. As politics is very much part of our life from the day we were kids, especially I was born the beginning of the Second World War, my name was War. <laughs> the well, beginning. That was your actual name? <laughs> my, my, the beginning, yeah, that was my name. Or a my nickname. My mother thought, thought better than that. No, no, it was called <laughs> Harb, War. Wow. And then they changed it later, I know. Uh, so uh, politics was always part of our life, you know. As kids, we were singing, politics we were doing. But in my uh, theatre work, no. I started, uh, I liked very much social satire, like satire uh, and, uh, and comedy itself, especially the uh, human situation, the marriage situations, and all the, <clears throat> I, I did a lot of these. Uh, but when I did my first television series in the uh, 70s, uh, <clears throat> mixed uh, uh, politics, with the uh, social satire, you know, mm -hmm. corruption of employees, which I was doing, I think I did, not much to do with the loose and uh, the politics in life. So uh, <clears throat> and then uh, I was, we were not allowed, let's say, we were not allowed to, to do politics, uh, comedy, politicians and politics. Yeah. So we went into secret, always hiding the names, always its meaning that. Until after the uh, Gulf War, Jordan, as you know, was boycotted by everybody in the world. So the censor in the government at that time, I used to have censor, was not worried about what I say. If I annoy America or I annoy Saudi Arabia or I annoy these people, we were free. We couldn't care for anybody, as nobody cared for us. Mm. So this is when we started our uh, political theater, especially when uh, George Bush said, uh, senior said, we're going to have a new world order. We thought, my God, every time the West wants to do a new world order, they started in the Middle East, they practice on us. <laughs> so, so we did <laughs> first play, hello, new world order. But of course, we had to trick our government. When the censor told us, what's it about? We told him it's about uh, farming and health, uh, <laughs> general health thing like this. And when we went to stage, it was politics. Now, the strange thing is that the top politicians and the head of intelligence for all these were very interested to, hear, to see us. Because I think, and they, we, we, I know, after the first show to the head of intelligence, we said to him, Shall we go back with you <laughs> to the prison? Yeah. <laughs> he said, no, it's really democracy. Go and say what you want. I think where the success was, is we performed as artists. In the Middle East, usually uh, uh, people in the field of art and people in the field of culture either uh, are with the big boss uh, and uh, being very hypocritical of him or against we took our part as artists. We reflected the image of the situation, the political situation, to an artist without any agendas. This is what made uh, King Hussein come and see all our plays, uh, top officials, ministers, people from abroad, all used to come and see our plays, because we pushed the red lines 
we never offended or broke the red lines. You know? there is, our society is a very conservative society. They, they just, even if he doesn't like the king, he doesn't like to say bad things about the king. You know? So when we put politicians on stage, we put them in their political whether it was president, uh, ministers, and all this, we put them in, in in their politics, political thing. We did not satirize their bodies. We imitated their bodies. We did not like the sketches that that you have shown. You know. Uh, uh, you're muted again. Uh, we can't hear you. So if you could press the same button, then. We'll be able to hear. Why you. is it gone? I don't know. Here, yeah. Here I am. Why am I? Why, what's the matter with you? <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> so um, that, yeah, sorry. Yeah, that 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 will answer you. Politics is when we started political theater. We used to do theater and comedy. And day two, three days is it's not a it's not a tradition of theater. When we political theater. We had seven years like this on our state, full houses. And it used to be prime minister, the king, the ministers, head of political parties, and some kids. Those kids are very politically aware in the Arab world because it plays with our life politics. You know? We can't do anything to America. What America is doing for us everything every day. <laughs> so, so kids, old ladies would come to the theater and enjoy it because we were all politically cultured. And you mentioned that you didn't have any kind of censorship. I actually wanted to ask you about <laughs> that. So <laughs> That was a trick. In the Arab world, there is something stupid the government puts, puts in a Ministry of Culture or the Arts or Theatre to supervise every script. I remember sending one of my scripts to the Gulf. I was going to go perform there. The censor there out more than half of it. That's something stupid, you know, very silly. Well, of course, when I went there, I performed it as it is. Nothing happened. You know. uh, so, center is, is, is in all the Arab world. Now, when we did our play, the first play we did, New World Order, and the king, the head of intelligence, and the government came and saw it. And we had all the leaders on stage, the Arab leaders, the foreign leaders on stage, Apart from the king himself, had him in voice only. So we're still afraid of, of censorship. Uh, uh, the censorship did not say anything. The head of the government is attending my play. What are you going to do, censor? What are you going to cut out of it? Huh? So one time, <laughs> under secretary of the Ministry of Culture, said, why you don't show us your scripts anymore? He said, don't worry about it. They're all about farming. There's no, nothing, nothing to worry, nothing to worry about. No. So we actually did a fantastic step in the Arab world is that all our plays were written and performed, and our responsibility, which where it should be, was with the audience. If the audience doesn't like it; they can throw tomatoes at us. No? But they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> And speaking of audiences, uh, you said that audiences in the Middle East or in Jordan, where you first performed, were very politicized. Uh, but you also toured to the U.S. and to the U.K. Did you? Because yeah. did you feel a difference with the audiences? Were they less politicized? No, because the audiences who perform there are an extension of the audiences in Jordan, which is a mixture mainly of Jordanians and Palestinians, and uh, many other Arabs. But I mean, uh, we we performed in uh, Detroit, no, in Chicago. The Arabs are there, and then <laughs> there were some Iraqis there at the time of when Saddam was ruling. As soon as we, the president of Saddam, came on the play, on the stage, walked out. We asked them later. I said, "Why?" He said, "We are afraid. If he knew we saw a play with him in it, he'd execute us." <laughs> <laughs> That's the fear in the Arab world from politics. But we were invited by Saddam to perform. We did. We were invited by Gaddafi to perform. We did. But the audiences in, in, in America 
and in England are actually an extension of our audiences here. But they heard all about our plays and they were dying to see how this phenomena happened where Arab actors are putting their uh, or leaders on stage, criticizing them in a way, their politics, and even their own king. So we were a phenomenon in the Arab world, and the Arab world echoed all over the world. We got invitations from Australia, we got invitations from everywhere. But, uh, we toured the United States, and we did a performance in, uh, uh, in England, for, for, and then a couple of performances in England. And so I did some in Beirut as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now um, I'll move to Lara. Uh, Lara, you are Nabil's daughter uh, and you're also an actress. So I wanted to ask you, how, what was it like for you to grow up in this environment of political theater and did it uh, change the way that you developed as an actor? Uh, what was it like? Well, it was fabulous, firstly, because um, as a five-year-old, I got to go to the theater all the time. <laughs> I was like the number one fan wanting to basically be backstage constantly um, and you know having having a dad who was an I mean as a kid all you want to do is kind of copy your parents so I definitely I, I had a great upbringing around theatres and around sort of you know creatives and and makers really every birthday party dad and and his theater group would dress up as some characters and play with us kids do you remember it, one of them was called abu jazara which is a famous character that in the 70s i think dad played on tv but he'd uh, they'd all come dressed as carrots for my birthday party you know? 80s, 80s. 80s, 80s, sorry, 80s. Um, uh, so it was. It, it's made me who i am today i, I wouldn't be an actor if if my father wasn't one um, and how it's formed me I suppose the work we've done together over as I've grown up has definitely formed who I am today and how I perform but yeah, having having a, having someone who's in the arts as, at a young age definitely helped uh, and Dina how did by you the way can I say oh, something yeah yeah of course yeah. of course uh, Lara by the end we were performing solos she and I whole play, I would write it for me and her. And then uh, as a, a comedian, by the end, people saying, uh, we'd like you to perform, but only if your daughter is with you. <laughs> well, I was very proud of that. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good sign. That's a very good yeah, sign. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Dina, can I ask you, uh, how did you get involved in theater? How did you become a uh, political, social, community theater maker? Well, I, I first got involved in theater when I was about eight. Um, it was when I first moved to England and I went to see a local sort of performing arts school doing an, a presentation evening. And I really liked what they did. And I said to my mom, can I do that? I want to go, I want to do that. Because we didn't really have anything like that in Baghdad. And so that's how I sort of got involved in the arts and performing. Um, and then I worked as an actor throughout my teens um, and, you know, into my adult years. And then I think it was, it was the war in Syria that kind of um, in, made me want to act and do something because I just couldn't bear what was happening in the Middle East, you know, in so many different countries. Um, and that's when I went to Lebanon, to Beirut, and I started working with Syrian women um, um, on, in theatre. And that's what that's how it started, really. And then it just kind of grew from there. And, and how did you meet the Sawalha family? Well, um, we were all in a play together uh, called Rest Upon the Wind, which was about um, Khalil Gibran. Um, and yeah, we toured around the Middle East and had the best time. It was brilliant. Um, and you mentioned the work with uh, the women, uh, and that, that was the project called Terrestrial Journeys. Is that uh, right? Yeah. yeah, that was one of the projects. There were two. I did. I worked on a project of Antigone, um, which was the, an Arab adaptation of the Greek tragedy. 
and then the following year I produced and directed my own project called Terrestrial Journeys yeah and that was with the same group of women uh not all the same it was a much smaller group but some of them were the same and some were new yeah mm -hmm. yeah and and they were all non-actors yeah they were all kind of they never had they had zero experience in theatre in performing in the arts um, they all lived in refugee camps in Beirut and they were all really really keen and eager to be involved and absolutely loved it um yeah I uh, I read your blog uh, about terrestrial journeys I actually read all of it I it was it was fascinating it was so wonderful to read about them and like about how passionate they were and how seriously they took it yeah um, And I wanted to ask you what it was like um, working with non-actors versus with actors in the Middle East. Um, I mean, with non-actors, especially the women that I worked with who had no experience, really got to start from the beginning. So we did a lot of, sort of we would do in the morning, more sort of training workshops where we would talk about um, posture and, and voice and projection and, um, how improvising out of bed. playing and that kind of thing and um so you've got to like go back to the basics mm -hmm. you know and elicit that from them and a lot of them are creative and they have that in them they've just never had the opportunity to exercise it or to to bring it out of themselves and so it's about how you get it out of them um so yeah it's, it's I, i love it i love it Whereas working with actors, obviously, they already know that. So, you know, you just dive straight into the work. Um, I remember reading one part where you asked them to create like images or tableaus. And uh, you, I think you mentioned that they came up with something that was quite uh, very literal, like a, a boat on the Mediterranean and stuff. And you're trying to kind of ease some more metaphorical content out. Can you tell us a bit about how that that worked? Oh, I can't remember. It was so long. <laughs> so I, I, I read about it recently. <laughs> I definitely remember them creating an image of a boat and all sitting on a boat. And I sort of thought that's a bit, it's a bit too obvious and literal. And I think I just tried to explain to them to just think outside the box and try different images that might make them feel the same, but not an actual boat. Um, and use like sticks or, or props or whatever we had to sort of create a different image. So we would use like plastic wa empty water bottles or bamboo sticks or pieces of fabric, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. And uh, just by that image that you mentioned in your blog, it seems that there was quite a lot of political and social content that they chose to deal with in that show. How, how important was it for the women to talk about political issues? Um, Well, it, it, it actually, a lot of them were afraid to talk about political issues. And when I first started the project, a lot of them, they were sort of very cautious and a bit nervous about joining in, even though they really wanted to. And some of them, their husbands wouldn't let them. So I had to go to some of their houses in the camps and speak to their husbands and just explain what the project was and, and reassure them that it was nothing to do with politics. And my aim is never to talk about politics in a show or to make it a political piece of theatre. But by the nature of where they're from and what's happening in their country and what's happening right now it's sort of and, and, the, and the process of doing it it sort of is political if that makes sense um but it but it's never political but uh, but one thing i wanted to make sure is that they the piece is it's a devised piece so that they have the right to sort of talk about what they want to talk about um And it just happened to be that because they were refugees a lot of them talked about their journey or you know what it was like for them living in Beirut and that kind of thing um yeah so I guess it wasn't important to them but it naturally sort of came out of them no that that makes sense that makes sense a lot and I think you are right that the process is definitely political I think the yeah. way that a company or a maker relates to the people that they're working with especially when making community theater uh that in itself is a political act the amount of respect and authenticity uh and um power that you give to your participants to choose what they talk about is in itself a political act. Yeah. And the fact that you are performing downtown Beirut, where you've got 
a wide range of audience coming from rich Lebanese to expat British to some refugees from the camps and they're all together and they're watching, you know, so that act as well is, is political, so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, sorry to quote your blog so much. I know it was a long time ago, but um, <laughs> I remember that you you just you described the audience that they're, they're the women's family members who were also refugees would sit side by side with middle class Lebanese families, and even bringing those two together again kind of creates that solidarity that you get people talking totally. about each other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now to I have a question for both you and Lara actually. So just answer whenever you want. Um, because you've made political theatre or community theatre in both the UK and in the Middle East, how would you say that, uh, that what, what the differences are between the way it, it, it's shaped, uh, what it looks like in, if it's different in the two countries? Well, I mean, for me, the number one difference is the censorship. Um, from working as an actress in the Middle East, when Lara and I were in the play together, we always had to have censors come and watch the dress rehearsal and they would always tell Lara, you're not allowed to do the kissing scene. Do you remember, Lara? <laughs> <laughs> um, kissing, no, no taking off your dress, no nothing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that is difficult. More, you know, you don't have that in England, in, in Europe. So that's a big difference and a challenge, I guess. Um, yeah. Don't know what else, Lara. I don't know, I'd probably say the same. I mean, uh, you know, as, as dad was saying, it, it, it varies where you are. It can be dangerous doing political theater. It depends on the circumstance. It depends on what you're trying to say. Um, I think it, our, our aim is the same, whether it's in the West or the East. It's just that in the West, it's, um, you're slightly freer in some aspects. Yeah. And regarding the process of making it, would you say that there are differences? Um, for me, there, there, there wasn't much difference, um, apart from the fact that they had no experience of theatre and had never seen theatre before. So I had to start from scratch. But um, other than that, not, not really, no. We, you know, we did the same exercises that we would do in London, the same games. You know, we started every day by doing yoga, by doing stretches and breathing, you know. And yeah, I, I just did it the same as I would in the UK. Yeah, no, pretty much the same. I mean, before dad and I and the group would go on stage, for example, we do laughter yoga. And, oh yeah, uh, I remember that. Shake it all out and get the nerves out. And, you know, you still have the same process of rehearsal every day, um, script, uh, cuts, not cuts, rehearsals, uh, singing, you know, so no, I wouldn't really, there wasn't much difference. I'm, I'm curious, uh, when you were uh, doing your work, Nabil, uh, did you did you have a repertoire system or was it more of a British and American system where you run for a specific amount of time every every night? Go off mute. Baba. Yeah, you're still muted. Uh, sorry, didn't get that. Uh, repertoire or what? The American system? Yeah, yeah, Don't exactly. The difference. I don't know the difference, really. I know what I'm doing <laughs> in my play. I don't have names. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> what would I do? We have a lot of that in the Middle East. And actors would say, is this Brechtian or is this uh, Stanislavski or is this... Uh, say? I say, no, it's a play. <laughs> Get, it over with. Get over with it. Uh, no, uh, I mean, uh, we would have three, four plays. We had them. We had, for example... For peace, we had uh, Haru Arab summits. We had uh, uh, what's it? Human Arab human rights. For example, when we went and performed to Palestinians uh, in, in occupied Palestine, we uh, we we made a mix of these plays together. Uh, as our work, we will my friend and I, Sham, uh, we will. Uh, I write the script, he will write something, I will write something, then, we'll put it together, then I work on it, I work on it. We, we worked on it as a, as a theater, we, we matured it. And in comedy, there's always a risk that the first night nobody's going to laugh. 
you might love a rehearsal, you will love, oh, fantastic and all this. And then the audience comes and what happened? And there were many a night that we spent the night, uh, of the first night after the play, until the morning, until we fixed the play. Uh, don't know what the audience is going to laugh about. Uh, the, uh, the political comedy theater is a, is a, 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 a work in process all the time, all the time, especially me, every day. Because that exchange every day, as you know. And especially in the Middle East, change every half day. <laughs> you have to keep up. Have to keep up with it, and to keep up with the actors. Also, we were first. The first we used to perform, as I told you, three four days a week, and then we performed the first play, New World Order, for two years, in Jordan. This is uh, miraculous. Uh, I have. I have. A, I have. I was uh, trained in England theatre, theatre theater wise at Lambda. So actors tend to go lazy, or tend to. I've I've said that word about a hundred times. There's not enough. I mean, seven hundred times we used to say them. So I I was always there, re rehearse them every day, every other day daily, before the play. Remind them. Now and again, I would change a little bit in the sentence. And he would go, oh, yeah, no, no, and I come back. And that creates life in the theater. It's very important, you know. But um, you have to keep up with the, with, the, with, the, uh, with politics. I mean, we have people coming to see New World Order from Syria, Saudi Arabia, and other places, uh, no less than 10, 12 times for the same play. But every time there'll be something new. They love that. Can I just say something on that with regards to what he used to do to us, Bava? Five minutes before going on stage, he would give me a new scene. <laughs> and he'd be like, oh, here, sorry, uh, I've changed this part. Can you please read that part? And I'm there going, oh, no, I can't. <laughs> so, yeah, you definitely kept it alive. Very good alive. training. It's good training, Laura. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. If you play a play for yeah. two years, you have to bring some new elements into it. Absolutely. Well, nothing now that kills life. Uh, sorry, Please nothing go. that kills life and art like apathy. You no. Know? True. Absolutely. To be um, predictable. And that moves us on very nicely to the clips that we have presented from Salam Ya Salam uh, to show. Uh, but before that, Nabil, do you want to give a, a very short um, out, out view of the context, the political context, so that our audiences uh, can make the most of the scenes? Uh, now, let me remember, one is with Burqiba, President Burqiba of Tunis, isn't it? Yes. That's the one we're going to talk about. Yeah, yeah. The, that one with Sadat, and then there's the other one with the peace yeah, negotiations. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is when uh, Sadat decided to go to uh, Jerusalem and give a speech. What was it? Uh, ah, give, give, a, give a speech. And Burqiba was a man, uh, a very sensible politician, and he didn't like extremes. He was head of uh, Tunis, and he was the one who moved Tunis into a very modern democratic state, you know. Uh, he was a, a very respected leader. And Sadat decided to go this without consulting with any Arab leader, to go in Jerusalem because he thought it's time to break the mold of everybody. And as you know, because of that, he paid with his life. He was shot. <laughs> yeah. So this is an argument between them. Burqiba trying to convince him uh, not to go. It easy, you uh, wait a little bit, we'll go together, and, uh, you know. And then, of course, uh, that uh, when you tell him, but the Arab leaders are going to be angry, he, you know, kind of made a, a sign finger to that. <laughs> so, I don't care for the Arab leaders, <laughs> useless bunch, no good, no good. And uh, so, uh, this, this was a lovely scene. I love to play Borghiba because he's such a nice, nice man. Talking to a, a slightly loud uh, Egyptian politician, you know, a clever man. He could see better, uh, Sadat, see reality better. And that the, the argument between them, 
don't go, wait a minute, be careful, the Arab leaders and all this. And he said, no, no, not to the Arab leaders. I don't know to talk to them. This is the kind of difference between the two personalities that, that uh, who paid in... Uh, and by the end, uh, Borgiba failed, and he went to Jerusalem, came back, and got shot. <laughs> and that's the scene. And with that, let's watch the scene. Thank you. أهداً وسهداً أهداً 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 ولا حاجة عجيبة غريبة يا 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 ينور أنا أنا محتار أنا محتار تماماً كيف قدر يقنعك هذا الثعلب الصهيوني هنري كيسنجر تروح يزور القدس لوحدك ولا ماني فاهم ينور لا 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 أنا اللي كنت مستعد أبوس بتاع أمريكا <تصفيق> أبوسها لغد لرقع سينا الماس ولا أنا خايف عليك أنور خايف يزعلوا عليك العرب ويقاطعوك العرب إيه؟ يطلعوا مين العرب دو بتخوفني بمين يعني بالأرض دول ثلاث ملايين كشر <تصفيق> ولا قطر قطر دي دور ونخلتين ولا سوريا أنور 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 هدي رجال هدي رجال إحنا الزعماء العرب مش اجتمعنا في المغرب وقررنا انه نعترف باسرائيل ونصلح اسرائيل اديك قلتها بعظمة لسانك يا راي اذا انتظر يا ينور والله في الوقت المناسب كل زعماء العرب يروحون معك القدس كلنا يا ينور حابين نزور القدس لكن نريد الوقت المناسب يا ينور سنه سنتين ثلاثه اربعه ونروح سوا سوا ايوه بس الزعماء العرب شعارهم اليومين دول احب المؤمنين ولست منهم حيث كده بقى انا اللي حروح وعلق الجرس لوحدي الله انا خايف عليك انور خايف عليك من العراقيين والسوريين والاصوليين والله يمكن علقوك من لا استغفر الله العظيم <تصفيق> يطلعوا ايه الاصوليين ولا السوريين ولا بتخوفني بالعراق الواد الكاوبوي ابو طبنجة على جنبه ده لا بقول يا سي الحبيب نعم ما تيجي نيجي نعم <تصفيق> انزور القدس انا وياك ولا انت راخر خايف يعلقوك من لا 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 لا, لا مش خايف يعلقوني من حاجه ومش خايف ليه؟ ما في حاجة يعلقوا منها أصلاً. <تصفيق> لكن قل لي أنور، قل لي أنور أنت متى اقتنعت أنك تروح تزور القدس؟ والله قبل أسبوع كنت قاعد وزي ماي فريند هنري كيسنجر. آه. أم قال لي تفتكر يا واد يا أنور أنه العرب واليهود بيتصالحوا؟ قلت له إكزاكتلي أي دونت نو. ما هو برهاب سياسي وبرهاب سينو أم قال لي المشكلة بين العرب واليهود الجدار النفسي قلت له حيث كده بقى أنا هروح وهد ديك سلسفيل أبو الجدار والله أنا خايف عليك ينور خايف يصير فيك مثل شمشون وينهد جدار عرسة إزاي ينور أنا زرت الأردن قبل السبعة وستين زرت م. الأردن وخطبت في المخيمات الفلسطينية <تصفيق> قلت لهم يا جماعة اتصالحوا وتفاهموا انتوا وإسرائيل وعيشوا سوا سوا في فلسطين وعيشوا سوا سوا سلام والله أنا فكر الجماعة صفقوني والله صفقوني بطماطم خربان عرس <تصفيق> لا أنا مش حسأل في حد أبدا أنا إذا الفلسطينيين عرضوني هرحلهم من مصر بالبيجاما ليش انت سمحت للفلسطينيين يلبسوا بيجامات انور في مصر؟ لا <تصفيق> انما نصحت ابو عمار آه. قلت له يا واد يا ياسر آه. ما تاخد غزه واريحه اولا يا اخي وبعدين توسع آه. تفتكر جاوبني وقال لي ايه؟ ايش قال؟ قال ودي تيجي يا ريس <تصفيق> حاجة عجيبة غريبة أبو عمار هذا حاجة عجيبة غريبة دائما في المؤتمرات المسدس على جنبه هون نقول بإذن الحر فلسطين الحر فلسطين الحر فلسطين ها بدأ يحرر في الأردن صفى عندي بتونس قل لي أنور هذه غزة ريحة هذه فكرة جديدة خالص هاي دي فكرتي أنا فكرة إسرائيل تعطينا أبو عمار غزة ريحة أولا ما هو إذا أبو عمار ما قبلش ياخذ غزة وأريحة دلوقتي بعد عشرين سنة هيدوله أولاً فقط 
والله يا انور لازم نحل القضيه الفلسطينيه والله قلبك كبير انت يا راي لا لا انور لا قلبي كبير ولا حاجه انا خايف على تونس <تصفيق> خايف على تونس من مي انور تونس تشبه فلسطين مم. وخايف ابو عمار باسم القوميه العربيه يقومني ويجلس مكاني اه لا ما تخافش ما تخافش امريكا دلوقتي هي كل في الكل امريكا هي القوه العظمى اللي ما يخافش من امريكا ما يخافش من ربنا دي امريكا هي اللي هتنفذ السلام وتخلي الكل يوقع على السلام والله يا انور انا خايف عليك لانك انت رجال سابق زمانك ومثل ما قال بيتهوفن يا وين اللي يسبق زمانه لانه يا انور اللي يسبق زمانه يكون عبقري لكن يواجه مشاكل صعبه وخطيره في الحياه انا اشكرك انك صنفتني من ضمن العبقره حيث كده بقى لازم اروح القدس واحلها ان شاء الله ارفوا لا ولا راجعون باذن الله راجعون وانا لله وانا اليه راجعون انور انا بقول راجعون على القدس يا رجال مش على جهنم انور يا مفاوضات السلام واشنطن الوفد الاردني الفلسطيني المشترك برئاسه الدكتور عبد السلام المجالي خلفي تحت المظلة خوف تبرد يا <تصفيق> مستر روبنشتاين الوفد الإسرائيلي <تصفيق> بنحب نذكركم إنه ونظرا للظروف الاقتصادية العاقلة التي تمر بها الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية أي شيء بتوكلوه أو بتشربوه بتدفعوا ثمن بتحبوا غدا وفد الأردن الباشا آه منسف لو سمحت بس الجميد كرك يا الله يخليك حاضر آه وإحنا يا أخي بدنا طنجرة ورق دوالي لف صغير مع فلفل حراق إذا ممكن حاضر مستر روبنشتاين أنا بلاش أطلب بوكر من اللي طلبوه لانه اللي طلبوه بكفي للجميع. <تصفيق> لنبدا المفاوضات، تفضل. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. وعبد السلام عليكم يا باشا. <تصفيق> بلشنا مرجع. <تصفيق> آه، مستر روبنشتاين اسمح لي وتعبيرا عن حسن النية. أن أهديك هذه المسبحة تفضل شكرا يا باشا إن شاء الله نسبح مع بعض في العكبة وإذا حابين نسجل وقاع المؤتمر لحسن النية أيضا برضو إحنا مستعدين ليش تغلبها لك يا باشا ما هم الأمريكان بيسجلوا كل كلمة إحنا بنقول نو 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 ريكوردينج كاري أون شايف يا باشا نو ريكوردينج <تصفيق> اوكي 1 2 3 ريكوردينج امريكا تفضل يا باشا آه، مستر روبينشتاين احنا حضرنا اجنده كامله عن قضيتنا العادله ومتطلباتنا يا اخي قضيتكم العادله اي قضيه؟ شو اي قضيه؟ قضيه فلسطين فلسطين اه هاي القضيه <تصفيق> لا في قضايا اهم كثير من هاي القضيه بلش ابني آه، لا 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 الله يخليك يا اخي <تصفيق> انك دائما تحت المظله <تصفيق> وبعدين ديري بالك منه روبنشتاين ترى بلفك. <تصفيق> مستر روبنشتاين شو في قضايا عندك للنقاش؟ والله يا باشا انا بقدر اخلي الاجتماع الاول يكون نان بيبر ميتي بلشنا بالحكي الاعوج، ايش قصدك يا اخي بالنان بيبر ميتي يعني احنا بنقدم ورقه عليها مجموعه اقتراحات بس ما عليها لا عنوان ولا تاريخ ولا توقيع الورقه، ها؟ بنيخي بالاقتراحات هذول بنيخي 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 سنه سنتين ثلاثه اربعه لما الله يفرجك. شو بيقصد هذا يا باشا؟ يعني حر التبطيب 
كما يقول المثل العربي يبقى المعنى في بطن الشاعر تفضل مستر روبنشتاين والله يا باشا انا بختار اخي نبي خيبي انا ليش يا نبي ما يا شيخ نبي ما الاجتماعات بواشنطن واشنطن بعيد وغالي يا باشا ليش ما بين ما الاجتماعات يا اخي في في محل كريم في الاردن مثلا في ماذا بابا جنب جبل نبو ما خلى النبي موسى ما بيشوف الارض الموعوده يا باشا هاي تبعتنا هناك يا باشا لا او اذا بخب يا باشا بنعمل اجتماعات في في الكرك عند بيت المجالي <تصفيق> نعمل مثل ما بيعملوا بيت المجالي يا باشا بننزل على سير الكرك بنحط رجلينا في المي الباردة بنخوط طاولة المازة فوق السير وعليها قزازة ويسكي خلنا الماشي بنسوي اجتماعي الله لا يوطرز لك هذا مخابرات وقالين له كل شيء بس ناسيني العرب خوف الله ودوا يلف ما دبوا الكرك مشان ادور لي على مظله انا الثاني <تصفيق> لا خالو لا 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 يا روح مستر روبنشتاين اذا ظلت المحادثات هيك بدها كمان 20 سنه يا اخي ليش العجله مش انتوا العرب بكل عجله من الشيطان؟ اه شيطان يسحبك ونخلص منه لا لا ارجوك يا اختي تأدى تحت المظله الله يحفظك تفضل يا باشا مستر روبنشتاين احنا جمعنا قرارات مجلس الامن 242 <تصفيق> 338 قررها سنة 48 و 47 وقررنا المطالبة بالتعويض عن معاناة الشعب الفلسطيني باشا 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 انت بيحكي كلمة معاناة؟ طبعا معاناة معاناة الشعب الفلسطيني لا يا باشا ما في معاناة في الدنيا الا معاناة الشعب اليهودي احنا بنعاني اكثر من كل شعب العالم اسمع لاقول لك تفتحش باب المعاناة هالقيتة لانه معاناة كن سوت للعالم كله تعنايها اوعك
كله بالبس خود السواح من خمام مرض لا انا عارفه ضم روحه على بلدي مش قاعده هاي اقعدي يا اختي هون السالك بلد انت اقعدي مش بدنا نرجعها ونحررها معناته خلينا ندخل في الجد ونحكي عن عاصمتنا القدس لا قدس اكثر هي عاصمه اسرائيل الابديه مش على خاطرك القدس عاصمتنا احنا الابديه لا لا اكثر هي عاصمتنا اجي كفي شعبنا عانا وتهشى احنا بنعاني اكثر من كل شعب العالم ما كفيش انت بدي اقول لك شو بدي اقول لك شو بدي اقول لك شو بدي اقول لك والكوان والفوضات مش مناحة ولا تطاقوا ما كفواش انت تعرفوا يا تعرفوا وين رايحين جايين رايحين جايين من ورا ظهرنا وين رايحين؟ رايحين على النرويج النرويج؟ شو هذا؟ اسمه ليش شو في هناك؟ مفاوضات مفاوضات؟ اه مفاوضات مفاوضات غزة ياريخ أولا ما هم اتفقوا وخلصوا مفاوضات غزة ياريخ أولا اتفقوا وخلصوا مين اللي اتفق خلص؟ الوفد الإسرائيلي والفلسطيني خلص في وفد اسرائيلي فلسطيني بأوسلو غير واحد وفد اللي بواشنطن نعم 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 والله انا شان مريحة وريحة عاطلة والله انا خاش في فار بالموضوع يا باشا والفار في بنطلوني احكوا انا انت في بنطلون؟ ضروري يعني اكون نافسة بنطلون عشان احس باللعبة وقف ولا افهم منك يا اختي وين رايح المظلة يا بنت يا بنت المظلة والله غير تصير تعطس برا راحت فرطة المظلة ها أنا زعلان يا باشا أنا زعلان أنا مش مصدق هذا اللي بصير أنا أنا ممكن أرجع لإسرائيل وأستقيل على هذا اللي بيعملوه طبعا مش معقول من تحولت لنا المفاوضات لمماطلات بس شو بدك يا باشا أكثر من إنه في هذا المفاوضات أنتم خليتونا نعترف بالشعب الفلسطيني وهكوا على أرضه لا طاولة المفاوضات أنتم ما اعترفتوا بشي إحنا انتزعنا منكم مفاوضات الكوريدور على الواقف هي المشكلة يا باشا مفاوضات الكوريدور الكوريدور ضيق وانت عريض الله يخليك يا باشا لما انت بخسرني في الزاويه يا بعترف يا بموت ما انت بتجيش الا بالضغط ضغطك ما شاء الله عليه يا باشا الله يخليك اقول هلا يا باشا شكرا للمسبخه انت اعطيتني فكره انا بدي ارجع لاسرائيل واعمل مصنع مسابخ مش انا للعالم العربي لانه انا شفته في العالم العربي انتوا بسبخ كثير الحمد لله كلنا مسبحين <تصفيق> انت يا باشا شو بدك يا عمر؟ والله راجع على الاردن ان شاء الله شو بدك يشتغل هناك يا باشا؟ بلكي صرت رئيس وزراء اذا صرت رئيس وزراء يا باشا راح تحتاج للمسبخة تبعنا ليش؟ لانك راح تكفر <تصفيق> يلا اللي علينا عملناه وساعدنا اخواننا في الحصول على كيان وهوية ظل ندور على مياهنا وندور على اراضينا و... الله يقطعك هذا حمام رجعت لي Thank you so much for sharing uh, that video, those two videos uh, with us, Nabil. And um, just to kind of give a bit of context about the second scene as well, do you think you could tell us a little bit about the second scene with the peace process uh, in Washington? Yeah. <laughs> I love that scene. I love. I used to love being Rubenstein, the negotiator. Because we actually, to write that scene, uh, we asked the negotiators themselves. The guy who is the Jordanian negotiator, Abdesalam Majali, who was prime minister, we sat with him and heard what he says. And then the umbrella, the Palestinian, the Israelis refused to talk with the Palestinians unless they are under the Jordanian umbrella, which you saw in the Jordanian umbrella. Okay. And then Rubenstein. And they, and they said, you know, the Jordanian delegation would go and talk to the Israelis, and the Israelis will put certain conditions. Jordanians will come back to them and said, we agree. The Israelis said, you agree? Oh, we have to go back and look at it again. You know, <laughs> the art of dallying, the art of distracting, the art of this is an incredible art of Israel. This was negotiation in Washington. It was the Prime Minister Abdesalam Majali, uh, who was played by my friend, and the Palestinian. Who, uh, and you saw the kind of uh, distraction. We're coming here to discuss Palestine. Big issue, big problem. The whole world is 
uh, has not been the same through the problems from Palestine, you know. And yet, uh, Rubenstein uh, is talking about the uh, pigeons, Jordanian pigeons coming to Israel, Eilat, and uh, mucking up their tourism with, uh, with pigeon shit. So, <laughs> and, and, and Palestine is getting mad. I said, what's the matter with you? We want to talk about Palestine. He said, oh, I don't know Palestine. This is something I found when I went, uh, when we performed in Israel. I would tell them, you know, you cannot forget the Palestinian diaspora. And they say, oh, there's only Jewish diaspora. I said, no, we have it in Jordan. <laughs> we have uh, millions of Palestinians all over the world. And unless you remember that, there will never be peace. And after our visit with this, I discovered there will never be peace with Israel because they, they live in another world, in a cuckoo world. Our parts of the Middle East, there, it'd be very easy to mold in the Middle East and become part of it and have a good life with all of us, the Middle East. The Middle East is a nice place, nice country, nice weather, nice lovely history, nice everything. But they just have, as, as one Israeli said, that the Israelis... Uh, uh, they don't uh, want peace because they worship the god of war. It's good business, war. You know, and this is actually uh, so. Uh, this was a, a negotiation. It shows how useless it was to negotiate peace with Israel, because what they have in their mind, the Israelis have nothing to do with the understanding of peace as giving. The human rights to the Palestinian or rights to the Palestinians or living in peace with the other neighbors. It, they have a, a, a weird, different mindset. And we showed it in that sketch how we're try, trying to get to the subject and how Rubinstein, oh, it's a pigeon, oh, well, Palestine, oh, where is that? Oh, you know, all the kind of, it's a lovely character. I met the guy as well. <laughs> a nice character, nice character too. Play, you met him uh, in, in real life. You know, we're all, we're all Semites. We understand each other very well. And you met the character that you played, and did he know? Does he know that you play him? When we performed in uh, in, 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 in occupied Palestine, we're not supposed to say Israel. You know? <laughs> did he see the play? Did he see himself on stage? Uh, well, I, there was after a, uh, after a show. There was a lot of gathering and things like this, and. Uh, because there's another sketch which we do about Joshua, the Jew, how he uh, he was supposed to be, but he, you know, all he did was kill, 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 he killed everybody in Jericho, <laughs> everything, animals and goats. We profit and we worship this prophet. So we did a very satirical sketch about that. I don't know, uh, I don't know if they showed it to you. But anyway, uh, yeah, yeah, it was him and there was other people and they said, Oh, you are a bit racist, huh? Because we satirized Samson and Delilah. We made Delilah Palestinian and Samson was uh, Jewish. And, you know, and every time he said, I killed a thousand people with my donkey's jaw. She says, stop exaggerating. You're boring our life with it. And he goes down to two by the end, you know, this kind of thing. So some of the, some of the Israelis came to us and said, oh, there were some racist comments. I said, well, you should know. <laughs> So that's why he mentions Samson um, in the in the first sketch. He says, "Oh, you uh, you become like Samson." And yeah, you yeah, well, that, yeah. Ridicule, so we ridicule, we ridicule some of the biblical mm -hmm. stories. Uh, you know, like Joshua, he would say, "You know, let's go and kill our neighbors," and mm -hmm. his people would say, "But uh, Moses said in the Ten the Commandments, don't kill." Said, no, that was the eleventh commandment. It got rubbed off when he was coming down the mountain. He slipped, Moses, and uh, as I killed that. <laughs> so, so, and 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 these are uh, uh, beliefs that we, uh, the Muslims here, believe in them. And the Christians, Prophet, call him the Prophet Joshua. He killed every Palestinian he met. So, <laughs> so it's a bit satirical. You know? mm -hmm. Anyway, and it was all in good spirit. You mentioned that because it's comedy. You see, comedy. You can say whatever you want. If you say it well, you're laughter. All what we said, if we said it outside comedy, we get killed. Mm. 
I wanted to ask you about the reception of the show because you played obviously in Jordan quite a bit, uh, but you you tour you went to Palestinian communities within occupied Palestine, but also uh, to mainly Israeli communities. So how was the show received differently? Well, the Israelis did a trick. They came and filmed us in Amman, pretending to be French television. Because, you know, the Israelis talk a lot like he's a French. <laughs> they interviewed us. They put it on Israeli television, which we would not have accepted if, they, if we knew they were Israelis. And what excited them was the fact that I was, we were doing their leaders on our stage. Uh, Rubinstein, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Rabin, the one they killed, the they killed and all these people. So they thought this kind of recognition of them. You know? So they were very working hard on getting us to perform in Israel and the Palestine and the villages. Uh, I wasn't excited because, uh, you know, this peace process was a bit funny and I'm Jordanian. I am an Arab, belong to my Arab world. King Hussein himself used to call me every now and again say, what happened? Are you going? Because he wanted us as a comedy theater group to continue the process of uh, the cultural side to be continuation of the process of peace. You know? My friend, who was originally a Palestinian, was very excited to go. I was a little bit, I was a pain in the world. So they said, I have nothing to do with it, you know. It caused us trouble. So anyway, they kept after us. And we, by the end, we decided to go there. No problem. We will do one show in Tel Aviv in English and 14 shows in the Arab villages. The day before we, are, we start, wanted to travel, they shot Rabin. So the whole mood was changed. Anyway, we waited 10 days and then we, we went there. And we performed very successfully. Uh, uh, the theater in Tel Aviv it was incredibly big. It was full to the end, you know, ministers, prime ministers, and all this. Uh, and uh, uh, so, and then we performed in 14 Arab villages. The sad thing is that Arab villages, they don't have a theater. They had to borrow a theater from the Israeli villages or settlements. So when we go there and see the head of the theater, the Israeli head of theater, I discovered some Israeli, very sad to say that they're thinking, they're biblical. They are biblical in their thinking. They're not with this world. They're not with the rest of the humans. They're not, it's very disappointing. You know? And even one of them said, you're going to make a comedy? So the Arabs don't laugh. <laughs> this was the guy who doesn't know how to laugh himself. Uh, anyway, when we performed to the Arabs, they saw us laughing at our politicians and their politicians and everybody laughing. They were really shocked, some of them said, my God, the laughter. So I think it was very good. But in a way, the, the Israelis are self-defeating in their own way. You know, they tried to use us for their own purpose. They did not think, like King Hussein wrote, is that we are opening channels of communication. And if you open it through politics and comedy, it's, it's a very important message. Because politicians can sign anything. People don't believe them. But there is a cultural theater exchange to be tried. They used us badly for the media. All the time used us to prove Israel as over as all this was this. I hated the trip there. My friend went back. I never went. They asked me, actually, one, one, one uh, Israeli television said, please come and say whatever you want about Netanyahu. Say, oh, no, no, no. I said, whatever I come, you will change. You will twist my words. And why do I want to come and say a word on Netanyahu? I don't care about Netanyahu or Paris. I'm from Jordan. I'm happy with my family here. Mm -hmm. um, 
that's that's very interesting that they 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 kind of use this kind of cultural peaceful exchange uh, to their political interests, um, and in a way, kind of like greenwashing today, you know, and and a lot of arms companies speaking of arms war and stuff you do that now you know they offer money for the arts or they have internships and stuff to kind of wash their the image you know um, something strange after uh, we went we decided to write a television series on the borders of jordan and israel to satirize both people and bring us together in comedy so i wrote half an hour and sent it to them in which i show clever people in israel and stupid in Israel, clever people, people, stupid people in Jordan. You know, you know how the mixture it is through comedy. It's called borders. Mm -hmm. I sent it to them. They said, no, no, that's not what we think. And these are the liberal people, the writers and the what's it not. I sent it to them and uh, and once they sent it back to me, my God, the racism was horrifying. They showed all the Arabs stupid and all the Jews clever. Mm -hmm. This is not going to be interesting even to see. It's going to be stupid. Mm. Because they, although the liberal ones, they don't like uh, extremists and uh, in Israel and things like this, but their minds are all twisted into a racist mode when it comes to the Arabs. You know? mm -hmm. and it's very weird and very uncomfortable, very unhappy. Ab absolutely. Um... I want to ask you, Nabil, and this is a question for everyone, so feel free to jump in. Um, do, do you think that in today's current political climate, and not just talking about Palestine and Israel, but do you think that in a political empowerment through laughter is still possible? Political, sorry, again? Uh, political empowerment through laughter. Just bringing back to what you said in your intro video of empowering people through la laughing at these political figures. Is that still possible in today's climate? Uh, Look, the concept of people laughing, as you see in America, you know, the, the, the political comedy is, uh, and the laughter itself is a form of making you bear a dictator, live with his nonsense, live with his cruelty, live with his stupidity, which is happening in America. I mean, comedians are having great time in America because Trump is a character. Relevant to what? But he ha he has a character. Obama was no character. He killed the business. <laughs> Comedy is always relevant to soften the atmosphere, bring people together, uh, see the human side in us. The only thing now, because the West playing up in our world here, because all because of Israel, they must destroy the whole Arabic world. Live to let Israel live, which is ridiculous. If we, Arab world is destroyed, Israel will die naturally. It, it doesn't make any sense. So we must destroy the Arab world. They destroyed Iraq, they destroyed Syria, they destroyed Libya, they destroyed any bit of nationalism in the, in the Arab world. So, and then they created for us Daesh, ISIS, and uh, all these extremists, which now we see Turkey is the one who was adopting them because Turkey now is taking the same people she put in Syria and Iraq to be ISIS. She's take, they're taking them to Libya. Okay. Now we know how the trick was, and America, of course, helped them. So this and the religious, the enemy of politicians, religion, is comedy. I see. So ISIS, um, this kind of religion makes makes anything you say, oh, the prophet, oh, God, oh, that kind of thing. But it's still there and will always be the concept of comedy as a human outlet. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to move a little bit to uh, working in the UK. And I wanted to ask both of you, Lara and Dina, so jump in, um, whoever wants to answer first. Um, what was it like for you as Middle Eastern actors working in the UK? And did you find any challenges? Uh, yes, actually, I have. Um, I'm, I'm talking like over 10 years ago now, but um, 
one of the the things that spurred me to make my own work was that the the challenge I kept finding is that there were no roles for Arab women and um, at the time of the Iraq war bearing in mind I'm Iraqi um, there were a lot of films being made you know um, Hurt Locker, Green Zone, Devil's Double there were all these films being made about my country um, and every time there would be a casting call my agent or I would submit our things and they didn't want to see me and I could never understand and then once I actually got an audition for the green zone which had Matt Damon in it um, and they said to me I went to the audition I read the script that they sent me and it was the part of a man because they didn't have any females for me to read. So I, I read, the, I read the, did the audition and he was like, yeah, that was really great. The only problem is there's no that there isn't a role for you in the film. Um, he said, but do you know any Iraqi male actors? And I was like, well, you know, no, I don't. I have family members, but they're not actors. And, and he actually asked me in the audition if I knew any Iraqi men. And, um, and so that was a constant challenge for me. And then another time I went, I did a voiceover, I did some ADR on the Devil's Double. And I was sitting there in this recording studio and the big screen was up and we had to do like background voiceovers. And I was watching it and the lead female role um, which was one of Oday Hussein's girlfriends was not Arabic. And I was, I was like, she, why have they cast a, a, a white girl? As, and they, they, um, they dyed her hair black because I Googled her after and I was like, they've dyed her hair black. She doesn't speak Arabic. She's white. And um, it really, really upset me. That was the first time that I actually realized what was happening in the industry and how how it made me feel as an actor and um and I asked the the ADR director I said why why have they done that why have they not cast an Arab in that role and he goes oh they they found a way around it and you know they they said oh well he's probably got girlfriends from all over the world so you know that's kind of how they get around it and they change the story and and then I asked another guy and he said it's all political because it's filmed in a particular country and then they want actors from that country so blah 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 you have to make deals and I just thought this is heartbreaking and so I went and made my own play <laughs> which was all women <laughs> we will get on to that play as well because I really want to talk about it but I want to hear from Lara as well what was your experience um, I think very, very similar to Dina. I think I find this industry frustrating at times. I think I'm in a bracket of like, like Dina, where I'm not dark enough to be an Arab and I'm not light enough to be a, a British actor. And so I'm, I'm stuck in the middle of people wondering, well, you've got green eyes. You can't be Arab. What's wrong with you? You're too light skinned. And I think, um, I think it's an issue in our, in our industry speaking quite frankly. And I, I think we're at a time right now where diversity is prevalent and it's sort of Baba hot the mute, Baba. He clearly enjoyed that. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think that it was it's it's tough being an Arab woman in this industry because again, I see roles played by English actors, and I'm like, you're not Arab. Yet you have a problem if I play a British actor. So it's double standards. And, you know, if we're going to talk about racism, I don't really want to so much get into that topic, but there, there it's, this industry is kind of full of those things where they're very dismissive of sort of women, female actors who are of Middle Eastern heritage. And I kind of feel like now we're at a time where things are changing and I'm hoping that we can all ride that wave, but yeah, it's heartbreaking. It's annoying, it's frustrating. And like Dina, we're just, we just keep pushing and breaking those doors down, hopefully. But yeah. More power to the both of you. Um, just, just while we're talking about um, your experience, uh, Lara, you've done a lot of political theater in the UK. Um, and I wanted to ask you, how do you choose to approach projects that are political because of your dad or, or did it, does it just happen organically? 
No, they find me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, came, I came back from, from Amman, from Jordan, working with my dad for about five years in the end of 2012. And I came and I straight away did uh, the play about Khalil Gibran. And then ever since, all I've done is political theater. <laughs> it's like ingrained in my name. <laughs> Um, I just, I feel, I think like once you do one, you're kind of known, oh, you know, you're in that circle of like, oh, she's done it, call her, you know, she's done it, call her. And, and then you just kind of build it up. And I also love political theater. I definitely have a lot more to learn about political theater. I, you know, working with my dad was, was such a stepping stone to understanding political theater. And I'm very grateful for that. And um, I don't know, I think it's just in our bones, okay? It will follow me till the day I die. <laughs> I mean, that's wonderful. You know, as a political theater maker, I'm like, yeah, that's great. That's, that's, that's my life too. <laughs> um, so, so now to go back to another piece of political theater to talk about uh, Return. Uh, Dina, you mentioned it. It's your project that you made to kind of, uh, do all the things that you couldn't do when other people were responsible for casting and uh, ideology of the piece, I guess. Can you tell us about how that came about? Yeah, that was literally off the back of that audition where I came out feeling so frustrated and, and I just thought, oh my God, what do I do? How do I, I want to make my own work. And at the same time, all this was happening in Iraq and there were so many Iraqi refugees in Jordan and in Syria. And I just thought, why don't I start exploring that and make a piece of work about Iraq and about women in Iraq and my experience of growing up there under Saddam Hussein, but also now of the occupation and what's happening. And so I just saved up loads of money. I bought a video camera and I went to Syria and I met lots of Iraqi women who I interviewed on camera. Then I went to Jordan and I interviewed Iraqi women in Jordan. Then I went to Iraq and did the same thing in Iraq, in Baghdad. And, um, and I just sort of on my own started researching it with this idea, but not a single penny to, to work with and not even anyone else to work with. But I just kept doing it because I just wanted to do it. And it gave me something that I believe, you know, something to do that I believed in. And then I spoke to a director, Poonam Bra, and she said, I want to direct it. This is brilliant. And then we got a designer on board. So the three of us would sort of like brainstorm ideas and talk about what we wanted to do. And then we just applied for little small pots of funding every now and then and, and do sort of research and development workshops and, and sharings and showcases. And then we performed it at the Yard Theatre in London um, in 2012. And it sold out, it completely, it broke their box office record. They were so impressed and they were like, wow, we've, we've never sold out before because it was quite a new theatre at the time. And then we realised, oh, there's something in this, you know, let's keep developing it. And so we just kept developing it. And then we were invited to the Liverpool Arab Arts Festival. And then we were invited to um, the International Women's Festival in Amman and we performed it there. Um, and, and yeah. And then we just kept developing it, and and Laura was that as well. Laura is one of the cast. So it was a cast of five women, um, and the production crew were all women as well, like the designer, the video projection, the director, and but and that wasn't sort of intentional. It just happened by nature of the piece. Um, so that yeah, that was amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um. Laura, do you want to talk to us a little bit about the project that you're working on right now with uh, Dina and Good Chance? Oh, well, we uh, finished it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not really, it's not really that talkable because it's so early oh, in the stage. I see. I mean, we can tell you what it was, but it's basically a, we did a, work, an, our, a research and development workshop on Zoom of a new play that we're developing. Um, and Laura was one of the actors, again, involved in that. So yeah, super, super new. Dina is the person to talk about it. <laughs> but uh, it, yeah, it was, it, was a, it, was, it was great. It was a fantastic four day workshop. And okay. quite interesting doing it on Zoom as well. First time for me, definitely. I was um, about to ask how was what because I can't I mean, I can't imagine rehearsing on Zoom. 
Well, it was okay. I mean, it wasn't a rehearsal, which made it easier. Okay. Obviously, it's not ideal because being in a room together physically is way better. But we made the best out of the current situation that we can. And I think when good when COVID when lockdown first happened, one of the things that we talked about a good chance we had an emergency meeting, and um, we said that you know how do we keep artists employed? How do we keep giving them work because they are going to really suffer in this um, more than anyone else. Um, so we applied for emergency funding from the Arts Council for lots of different projects that would sort of pay artists to work. And one of them was to, to develop this idea that I'd had for a long time because I had read my friend's script. Um, it's about Sudan. Um, and we got the money and we did um, a four day research and development workshop so we read the script we talked about ideas we improvised and it worked actually surprisingly well there were a few technical hitches admittedly you know people's internet cutting out and things like that and I think eight hours on zoom is quite tiring um mm, yeah. but it was definitely useful and we definitely got a lot out of it and so did the writer so it was definitely worth doing yeah it's better not doing anything yeah yeah, it was really, I was going to say better than not doing anything. It was, it was really nice to be back in that sort of brain sort of workforce. It's kind of like showing away the cobwebs. <laughs> yeah. Everybody was like, we haven't worked for ages. We're so tired. <laughs> <laughs> so rusty. Yeah, the, beauty, the beauty of Thank working you. on Zoom is that, you know, Lara, when I rang her up and said, are you available? These are the dates. She said, well, I'm available the first two, but the second two, I'm going to be on holiday in Greece. And I was like, that doesn't matter because we're doing it on Zoom. So she joined us from Greece, which was great. <laughs> it was awesome. It yeah. has its benefits. Yeah. Have you got any any tips for any theatre makers who are now working on Zoom? Any kind of anything from your experience? Um, I would say eight days is too uh, eight hours in a day is too much for the actors. So mm -hmm. the first two days we did eight hours and we found that everyone was really knackered and it, it just was sort of difficult so the second two days we staggered it so we made it so that nobody worked more than five hours a day and they might do two in the morning and then rejoin us to and do two hours in the afternoon so we sort of staggered it and we had lot plenty of breaks every 45 minutes we took a five minute break and then with the usual hour break and the tea breaks and you know so you've yeah it's about planning good planning and the director was amazing so she planned it really well okay um, now, ju just one question for you, Laura. I wanted to ask you, um, what was it like working with your dad? Because I think that's quite a special relationship that you must have working as a father and daughter, as and as uh, you know, the leader of the company. Uh, we have a very special relationship, me and Pops. <laughs> um, uh, what was it like? I mean, you know, my dad's my dad at home, but my dad is my director in the workplace. And it, I never really saw it any other way other than, you know, he's the boss. You know, <laughs> I am the little actor who's employed. Um, <laughs> And given you scripts know, five minutes before. <laughs> you don't only give it to me. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but no, it was great because we, I love working with my dad. We have a fantastic working relationship. Uh, we, we work very well together. We feed off each other. Um, he pushes me, especially when it shows in Arabic, because all our shows are in Arabic. So th this is like the first time I get the script. I sound like, I don't know what, like I'm a foreigner who's been away from Jordan for the past like 500 years and I don't know how to speak. And then, um, <laughs> but it, yeah, you know, he guides me, he helps me. And within the first week I've, I've got the script and I've learned it and we're good. Um, I mean, it's brilliant. We were, I'll give you a quick funny example. We were doing a show, a Ramadan show, cause we always do big Ramadan shows. And it was just us two. It was the first time it was just me and him. And um, I go on stage and I open the show. It's a father-daughter sketch. And I'm opening the show and I'm talking about, oh, how I want to be free. And, you know, like, I'm going to go out and everything's going to be great. And then my dad from behind the stage is shouting at me. And then he comes on stage. He says a line and then I freeze. I black out. 
do you remember Baba? It's at Nadi Sayarat. And I forget my lines and there are 500 people just sitting there and I'm just staring at them. And I look at Baba and I shake my head and I'm like, nope, it's not coming out. And he kind of just stops the show and goes, don't worry, my daughter's just forgotten her lines. Give her a second. <laughs> And it, you just hear like a roar of laughter. And I take a second, I'm like, oh, I remembered them. And we continue. <laughs> so um, in that way, it's a very easy relationship. It's, you, we have fun on stage, which is really And nice. off the stage, probably, right? And off the stage, yeah. what I know of working with Nabil, it was always good fun. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, good fun, good food, you know, all of it. <laughs> all about the food and the fun. Uh, what was it like for you, Nabil, working with your daughter? Well, it, it was very pleasant to see your daughter doing so well. Lara is very good on the uptake. She takes instructions very well. It's a very, and in one way, it's a very professional relationship. I am demanding. Uh, my church is the stage. Uh, there is no mucking about with me there. You have to be committed, you have to do well. She learns her lines very quickly. She, is, she learns her instructions. She, she keeps them, doesn't forget. Uh, and sometimes I want more of her. She gives. It's a, it's a wonderful relationship, you know. It really is nice, easy to write for her. And she has a lovely stage presence, I must admit. I like her. And she does accents. I mean, she... She barely knows uh, Jordanian, but she did uh, an Italian Arab accent. She did uh, an Egyptian Arab accent. She did a Syrian Arab accent in one play. She played all these characters. Uh, <laughs> so uh, no, it was very pleasant. I missed her. But I think we reached a degree where she had to grow, challenge something else. And at this Ramadan theater, which I did for 20 years, and we wrote, 20 days or more for it. I reached a degree where I thought, it's time, really, I'm tired of it. And with the political changes so much, you say, Khalas, let her go and find her own way. In a more challenging world, which England is challenging, in the arse as well. <laughs> I don't like it. I don't like auditions, by the way. You go to auditions, and these nitwits there think you are a minuscule insect in front of them you know i won't have i won't employ them in my uh, as a driver <laughs> but i had trouble with these these auditions because i came from a place where i make my own auditions i write my own plays i put my own conditions on the production and you go there and he tells you i want you to do an arab ambassador and you do an arab ambassador i know arab ambassadors most of them my friends and we, they talk like this, they talk nice. And he says, can you make him a bit like that? You know, you know Arab ambassador, so a few. Now walk out. <laughs> I totally get you on, on auditions. I don't like, I don't like auditions either. I don't like holding auditions. I think it's such a yeah. strenuous process. And yeah, no, I don't, I don't like it. Um, Thank you so much. Unfortunately, I think that is all we have time for tonight. But if you have any uh, closing statements, if you want to add anything else, now is your chance. Uh, yes, I will say something. In Arabic called Yatiki Lafye. God give you good health. You run it very well. Very well. <laughs> I don't think Thank we can you. blabber anymore unless the girls want to. But I've done enough blabbering for tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, okay, thank, thank you. you. And okay. for, those of us, for those of us watching, join us again in two weeks' time to watch Stones and Oranges by Ashtar Theatre from Palestine. We will be talking about their show uh, with uh, the actors of the show, Iman Awun and uh, Edward Mualem. We'll also be joined by the director, Mojisola Adebayo, and also by Richard Falk, who is a professor in, uh, of international law, and he was the former UN Special Rapporteur for Palestinian Human Rights. Uh, and he will be coming on the panel as well. So see you again on the 31st of August. Send us the link, please. I will do. I will do send. I will send Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye, girls. Bye. Bye.
Ah. Ay, la, 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 la.